last time on asymptotic notations, we try to get an intuitive understanding of the big O notation. And in doing so, we considered two different examples and, you know, just tried to use a logical thinking method of trying to understand what the big O time complexity really means. Today, we're going to go back to the same two examples, but instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the rigorous mathematical definition of the big O notation and try to figure out how it actually works. You're watching episode 2 of Asymptotic Notations. Hello and welcome back to Asymptotic Notations. Now, we're going to be using the same two examples that we have from the previous lesson. We'll be focusing mostly on selection sort and we'll be looking only at its time complexity. What we're going to need to do is this. We're going to have to figure out how many operations the algorithm actually carries out. Then using this figure, we can actually use the definition of the big O notation to rigorously find a proper representation of that algorithm in terms of the big O notation. So let's begin. Let's jump right in to actually counting operations. Now, counting operations is something that is not easy to teach because the technique in which you do it depends on the implementation of the algorithm. In some cases, it can be extremely simple, as is the case with linear search. In fact, for linear search, it is no more complicated than just doing it intuitively because ultimately the algorithm just makes one pass and it looks through n items at maximum. I couldn't complicate this even if I wanted to. But that is not the case with selection sort, which is quite a bit harder. So what we're going to do is for the remainder of this episode, we're just going to focus our energies on selection sort. In the case of selection sort, let us begin by counting the number of operations. Let's start simple. Let's just use an example in which there are 8 items. In other words, n equals 8. On the first pass, we basically have to look through 8 items. And when we're done with that, one item gets put in place. So we can ignore that one item and just look at the remaining 7. So that means in the second pass, we're only looking at 7 items. That puts one more item in place. And in the subsequent pass, we only look at 6. So you can see the pattern, we start off at 8, then the next pass we look at 7, then 6, then 5, and so on and so forth until we are left with just 1. So what this means is the total number of operations looks something like this. We're going to have to sum the decreasing numbers from 8 all the way down to 1, giving us 36 operations in total. But the problem is, the big O notation wants you to do it in terms of the variable n. Of course, that makes things more useful since if we figure things out that way, then we can apply it to, you know, an input list of any length. So how do we do this in terms of n? Well, we know that in the first pass, we will look at n items. In the next pass, we'll look at n minus 1. In the subsequent pass, we'll look at n minus 2, and so on and so forth until we hit 1. The problem is, what does this whole thing sum up to? You wouldn't know because you don't know how many terms there are right here. And therefore, it's not easy to just look at it and figure it out. Thankfully, in mathematics, this is what is known as an arithmetic series. And in fact, properties of arithmetic series are already known. Very luckily for us, what this means is we do actually know that this whole thing simply sums up to n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So you see what I mean when I say, you know, different algorithms require different techniques to figure out the number of operations done in total. In this case, we happen to be able to invoke the concept of an arithmetic series. But for a different algorithm, you may have to use some other technique. At any rate, we are very lucky to be able to find out that, well, that is basically the number of operations performed. And we can move on to the next step. What we need to do now is we need to take this function that tells us the number of operations in terms of n, and we need to basically turn it into a big O representation. Right off the bat, there is actually a slightly more intuitive but slightly less rigorous method that I want to mention to you and get it out of the way because it's something that may be done, but 
isn't that perfectly rigorous just yet. You see, what you can do is you can just expand everything out, look for the largest term and keep only that. That means you discard the other term, so you're left with an n square term. Incidentally, with this term, you can throw out the coefficients as well. You don't need that. And what you're left with is just a function. And once you stick the big O and the brackets around it, there you go, selection sort is O n squared. Like I said, this is the intuitive way, and I guess it does make a little bit of sense because, well, that is the largest growing term in the entire function. Obviously, when n gets very large, n squared is the thing that gets the largest the fastest. But I'm just mentioning this in passing. Things can be done this way, but it's still not perfectly rigorous. So we're gonna just put that aside and look at the proper way to do things. We begin by considering the formal definition of the big O notation, which looks something like this. Not very easy to understand, so let's walk through that bit by bit. First of all, f and g are functions. We can say that f equals og, in other words, basically the big O representation of f is g, if and only if the following is true. The function fn needs to be greater than or equal to 0, then the function c times gn needs to be greater than or equals to fn. This needs to be true for all values of n greater than a threshold and not. Both c and n need to be positive real values. So that is quite a big definition and it may not make a whole lot of sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand it better by drawing it out. Let's say we have an arbitrary function fn. Of course, fn would be something like, you know, the number of operations that we've calculated earlier. The horizontal axis represents increasing n, whereas the vertical axis represents the number of operations. So really, this is a plot of how it performs depending on the size of the input. Remember how I said big O notation kind of works like a maximum? Well, this definition enforces that. We introduce our function cgn, and whole idea is cgn needs to be larger than fn itself, so it needs to be somewhere above it. Now it doesn't have to be larger all the way, as you can see at this point, fn is actually larger than cgn. The reason why we're allowed to do this is because of this last part in the definition. This whole thing only needs to be true starting from a particular value of n. And what this means is we can say that n0 is right here, and basically what that means is cgn only needs to be larger than fn starting from this point. So hopefully this paints a better picture of the concept. The whole idea is we want to find a function that can serve as an upper bound to the actual function itself. So what this means is, knowing your original function, in this case fn, you can just choose a value of gn and try to find two positive values c and c0 that fit the definition. If you are able to do so, then you can say that fn equals ogn. Let's actually try this with selection sort. We already know the value of fn, and let us just guess that the value of g is n squared, which of course we know that that is true, but we're going to try it using this method. So what we need to do is we need to find some value of c and some value of n naught that makes this inequality true. Now if you're doing this in the context of school, you're probably going to have to you know, do some rigorous maths to actually prove that it is true. But what we're going to do here, since you know maths is boring, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at it in terms of a graph. I'll show you the mathematical working later on. But right now, let's try to appreciate the picture. What I have here is an application called GraphCalc. As you can see right here, the brown line actually represents fn. It is simply our n, n plus 1 over 2, which is of course the number of operations selection sort does. What we're going to do now is we're going to plot n squared on top of it. And that is what we are asserting is the big O representation of the algorithm. This is drawn on screen as the green line, and as you can see, for the most part, it stays on top of the brown line, and that's great. Notice of course that we shouldn't be plotting gn, we should be plotting c times gn, even though n squared is technically just gn, 
we can consider it 1 times gn, in other words, c equals to 1. Everything happens to fit just nice in this particular case, but let's say you're trying this for a different algorithm, and you realize that gn actually dips below fn at certain points, don't despair just yet. You can actually try to increase the value of c to scale up gn, and see if doing so forces it to be greater than fn all the time. Anyway, back to our plot itself, of course, the two curves are looking perfect, we've even figured out the value for c, it is simply 1, so all we need to do is to figure out n0, and that is the point in which cgn starts to be larger than fn. If we actually zoom in onto the two curves, you realize that they intersect at this point, and starting from this point, cgn starts to be larger. As you can see, when I bring my mouse over that point, it is at the coordinates 1, 1. So there we go. That is the value of n naught, simply 1. Of course, you should be looking in the horizontal axis for that value. And that is basically how it's done. You need to find a value for c and n naught that makes the whole inequality true. Of course, if you're in a class, you're going to have to prove this with actual math. So what I'm doing here is I'm just writing out my algebra that proves it. So yeah, this is another one of those parts that are very dependent on the actual algorithms themselves. Obviously, in this case, it's just two quadratic curves. If you're dealing with things like log or you know higher level polynomial curves, you may have to do a little bit more math to sort of prove this. So we're actually almost done with the episode because of course we've looked at the rigorous mathematical way of doing things, but it's not my favorite method. As mentioned, trying to prove that you know, one function is always larger than the other isn't always a trivial or particularly fun thing to do. That is why I thought I would introduce to you a different method of proving that you know fn equals to ogn. This method is simpler to execute, but requires a little bit more mathematical understanding. And basically, it looks something like this. You want to take the limit as n goes to infinity of fn divided by gn. If the result of that computation is less than infinity, then indeed fn equals ogn. Let's try this with selection sort. What we're going to do is we're going to take those two functions and divide them by each other. This gives us two terms, a term in which n is in the denominator, and a constant term. Now, what it means by taking the limit of n as it goes to infinity is simply we want to make n become larger and larger, and we want to see what happens to this expression as that happens. So what happens when n gets very large? Well, since n is in the denominator of this term, then the denominator is going to get very large. And what happens when you divide 1 by a very large number? Well, it's very small. In fact, as n goes to infinity, this term goes to 0. And basically what that means is the way we evaluate this limit is simply this term goes to 0 and we're left with half. That is basically how you evaluate the limit. And in fact, the answer, half, is less than infinity. And in doing so, we've just proven that indeed fn equals ogn. In other words, selection sort is o n squared. So what we've seen today is the rigorous method of taking a function and basically turning it into a big O notation version. It so happens that this function fn has something to do with an algorithm. And what we end up with is a property that characterizes our algorithm. Notice how the definition of big O notation makes no references to algorithms or code or anything like that, and that's because, really, the big O notation is just a mathematical concept. It actually has nothing to do with computer science. It just happens to be a convenient way for us to express certain things in computer science like time complexity and space complexity, and that is why we use this notation. But do bear in mind that this notation in and of itself does not really have anything to do with algorithms. So there you go, that is big O notation. Now, right before we wrap up, let us actually consider this very interesting quirk in the definition of the big O notation. Did you realize that I would technically not be wrong if I said selection sort was actually O n to a power of 100? That is actually not wrong, 
thanks to the fact that the definition of the big O notation simply requires it to be an upper bound. It doesn't say it has to be a tight upper bound, and that can make a whole world of difference. In fact, here's a very quick proof where I can show you that selection sort is O n to a power of 100, I found a value of C, I found a value of n naught, and what that means is, well, it's a valid thing to say, despite the fact that it's not a very useful thing to say. Of course, this doesn't stop the notation from being useful, and I'm confident that, you know, when this notation is used in literature, they do of course try to make it a useful tight bound, but it remains that there is this little quirk with the definition. And on that note, that is where we're going to end this episode. In the next episode, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some alternative notations, some of them enforcing a tighter bound than a big O notation. So perhaps in certain contexts, those might be more useful. But that will be for next time. For now, we're done. Thank you very much for watching. I hope everything has been, you know, clearly explained. If you have anything you're unsure about, do leave a comment in the comment section below and I will try to respond to you as quickly as I can. But yeah, that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.